Virtually Confidential presents Brand Storytelling and the Human Connection. There is this amazing need for brands to be able to tell their story and connect with their customers. And I kind of feel like it's going so much further than just a straight sell. Chanel made this beautiful production. It's a 32 chapter docu-series. And it looks like something that should be in a film festival. Um, and it's inside Chanel. And it's all about the brand's founder, Coco Chanel. But the brand story is actually based on her life and the inspiration behind her designs, her perfumes, Chanel number no. five. But it made it so easy for any customer, but myself included, to connect with the brand on a personal level. Did it did it show her home and the, the original store in Paris? It sh yes. And it also showed like the designs for the bottle for Chanel number no. right. five. And when, you know, soldiers would come back from war and they would flock mm -hmm. to the stores, the original stores, and they would buy their perfume and bring it home to their wives. And it had this just this romantic, Amazing. beautiful, beautiful story and way of explaining how this woman was able to become this icon and have still to this day the number one selling perfume in the world. Everything you just described there is all about connection. That's why you tell your brand story. You want people to be able to relate and connect to you, to your brand. Um, that's just what matters, and especially in today's age. You know, I for one, I can I can watch one video, just one video about one thing or one person, and hours later. I'm down that rabbit hole, but it's this curiosity that really allows us to connect and feel like we're a part of that story or we become experts. For somebody like myself who spent 32 chapters worth of a movie <laughs> Wait, watching. So how long were these chapters? That's what I need to figure out. You know, there are a few minutes, it's not war and peace. There are a few minutes <laughs> long, but they're so beautifully executed. Um, I, and it, I no you know, doubt. You lose yourself. If I have a product and I really want to tell that story, but not hold somebody, um, I don't want to say hold somebody captive, but I don't want to hold somebody's attention for a long period of time. That's tricky because you have to be succinct and, mm -hmm. and still emotional and make that connection. And it's not just like, hi, how you doing? I'm selling these jeans, but I, I, I'm still trying to wrap my head around how you can do that effectively. There's a formula, right? It's just like, just like the TV shows of today, um, I guess for the older crowd, uh, which I am proudly a member of, uh, mm -hmm. we liked movies. We did not necessarily have all of the, you know, binge worthy series, but it's mm -hmm. a formula, right? There, there's a hook, you have to hook them in, um, and then you're put on this emotional roller coaster, right? Mm -hmm. So you bring them in, you, you kind of get them hooked, you slow them down, you speed them up, you have a, you know, whatever the ending is, and then you add another cliffhanger. And at that point, you're just on this cycle. <laughs> but, but I can only imagine that, you know, this series that you're talking about, Chanel, was, was probably done, you know, in the most immaculate and innovative way that really probably drew people in um, and probably had some immersive aspects, probably had beautiful scenery and music that really enveloped the viewer into this brand story and, and right. gave all the details, but yet kept them yearning just for more right when that episode was going to end. So they absolutely stuck around for the next one. I don't know if you've seen Burberry's Discover the Tale of Thomas Burberry. It's a short mm -hmm. video. It's under three minutes. You know, for somebody like myself, I was big into Burberry for a while and then I kind of like pulled away, but it kind of brought, it, it was like a little bit of a, a seduction, if you will. Sure. Businesses have to have a heart and a soul so they can connect um, to the customers. If customers don't identify with you, if they can't connect, if they don't, if they can't see themselves in your product or in with your brand, then mm -hmm. you're not going to connect with them, right? So mm -hmm. you have to make sure that you can, ex you know, everyone has to experience the brand at their own pace, right? And they have to be able to touch it and see it and sometimes smell it, um, you know. Again, I'm a frequent, I would like to say I'm a frequent traveler to Paris. I love Paris. Um, but I'll tell you, there's one thing about going to the luxury stores there. There's nothing quite like being in a luxury store in Paris or even some of the, the high-end hotels. There's a there's a feel, there's an energy, there's a, there's a smell, there's fragrance, mm -hmm. there's something that 
doesn't exist anywhere else on the planet other than Paris that I've been able to find. And when you're there, you, your whole body is transported, you know, mind, body, and soul to some other location. It is, it's quite mesmerizing, and they have, they've really figured out how to do that. So the real question is for us is how do I convey that and how do I bring that to the web? Yeah, it's like, first of all, I love the fact that you 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 literally breathe life into the brands by saying that they have a heart and soul. So right there, I'm hooked. But then that's <laughs> a tricky thing because you're trying to figure out how do I take that essence, that heady essence that, you know, when I, I'm physically there, it's, you can't recreate that, but you're going to figure out a way to recreate that. Before you ever launch a brand, if we go back and we look at Coco Chanel or we look at, um, you know, the people, these designers who've created these high fashion brands, they had a mission. They had a drive to do a certain thing. They wanted to bring this fill to a, a clothing brand or to a fragrance brand. Um, so it wasn't haphazard. They didn't just like, oh, I'm going to create create a new line of clothing like right. no they had reason behind that so they knew their why mm -hmm. right and so once you know your why um you you can figure out your who and you have to be very selective so you don't want to necessarily especially in the luxury spot uh, or in the luxury line you're not going to cast a, a super broad net to try to attract everyone yeah, that can. actually would be brand tarnishing because you'd have to lower your price. You would have to, you know, maybe sacrifice, you know, a certain feel um, or energy about the brand. So mm -hmm. you actually want to niche down. You want to know your why. You want to know your who. And then you can look at, well, how do I make this happen? Um, and how do I create these physical locations to speak to my who and to convey my why? Um, and now... The, the, the trouble that luxury has had for many decades, really, since the inception of kind of web, web two, is how do I do that in this 2D, in this flat space? And it's incredibly difficult. And we see some who just said, forget it, we're not going to do it. If you look right. at Goyard, they, they don't sell on the web. They do have a website now. And if you want to talk to them, you can reach out. They might reply. They might not. <laughs> um, but you have to go to a physical store if you want their product. Right. And, and you know, so it is, it's one of those things where I think as we transition or as we're kind of teetering here on, you know, the cuspy edge of kind of web 2.5 with social media, you know, aspect that we're in and moving over to something, moving over to something that's a little bit more immersive, I think you'll begin to see some of those things come forward where we're able to create these experiences that really can hit more senses than you can typically do, right? Um, you get the visual, you get the audio, you know, the audio, you can hear things. Um, you have to interact, whereas on the web to, you know, typical web, you click and scroll and you're just looking at something. When you talk about web three and really bringing people in, they have to be an active participant, right? Mm -hmm. The whole idea here is to, to excite people is to lure them in, right? You want to be alluring. You want to evoke emotion. Pictures can do that, but I'll tell you what, if you have pictures and video and sound and you have to be a participant, that's going to go, you know, a hundred miles further than a, a flat picture could ever do. I think what we've learned with LVMH when they created like Louis the Game, for example, they were able to bring their customers into this incredibly immersive total immersive gaming to bring in gamers as well but also to learn their history and i think that that's an amazing way to take it just from you know from storefronts to websites you're bringing this to another level and that's fascinating to me exactly i think one of the things that lvmh did brilliantly with the game louis and, and nike to some extent with mm -hmm. nike land what they were able to do by creating these games and, and these experiences they have a demographic of which they they're selling to today right? right if we talk about boomers we talk about you know the gen xers again i'm a proud card carrying member of gen xers we don't care about anything um but they're able to cross over by bringing these new experiences to the younger generation gamers typically you don't think of a gamer as a luxury consumer most gamers don't. They wear some jeans, you know, they'll probably wear some vans. They 
definitely mm-hmm. wear, you know, maybe some Nikes or, or whatever, but they're not necessarily the people who will go out and buy, uh, you know, a five or six or $10,000 handbag, number mm-hmm. one, because um, most gamers, at least in the historical sense, most gamers were guys. Um, mm-hmm. That is definitely changing. Um, yes. Or they're not spending, you know, necessarily, you know, $400 on a wallet, right? Right. Because those are going to be the shoppers of the future, right? The boomers are going to, you know, begin passing on that vast amount of wealth that they've accumulated. Uh, the Gen Xers are going to be start, you know, handing down some of their inheritance to their kids. Yeah. And so you have to evolve as the demographic, demographics shift. And I think they've done a masterful job there. But now there's designers that are selling their virtual clothing to these gamers avatars so it's like i may not be sporting the louis purse or you know the tiffany necklace or whatever luxury item it is but there are people that are playing these games and they are the younger generation and they are dressing up their avatars and i find that fascinating it it can go back to you know i I call them shoot 'em up games if it goes (laughs) back to you know a halo you get to you know you get to unlock a certain helmet or you get to unlock a, a armor, right? Your the way your guy looks, and so that was created. You know, it's twenty years old. We've been kind of creating unique looks for our, you know, our game character, you know, individual game characters in each game for mm-hmm. for twenty or thirty years, and so eventually, as some of those younger people grow up, and some of those folks, um, you know, have begun to create fast fashion for themselves, right? I'm going to create this shirt um, that looks cool. I'm going to create my own line, and it has, you know, my pseudonym on it in a shirt. Mm-hmm. And they're like, well, what if while I'm playing maybe a role-playing game where it's just, you don't necessarily need armor, and you're not, like, running around shooting people, but what if I could create an avatar that dresses the way that I dress? And mm-hmm. so, someone saw that and said, well, hmm, maybe we partner with some of these games, right? Fortnite was kind of the, the big one. Why don't we right. partner and bring some unique digital items, maybe that don't even exist in the physical world, to this game engine or to this specific yeah. game, and let's see if people will buy them, and they did. Again, like you said, sometimes we we can't wear certain things um, that maybe we'd like to wear just because of the physical you know norms that have been created in certain places or the the societal norms so mm-hmm. when you're in a game or if you're you know again as we start to kind of build out these immersive experiences mm-hmm. why can't we we can do whatever we want i mean the experience itself might be on saturn or some world we've never even explored today so why can't i wear something that looks just absolutely bonkers you know I'll, I'll give you an example i'm not sure if you're familiar with the 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 brand a cold wall um samuel ross like samuel ross is the you know the the creator the, the head designer there some of the things that he puts out i'm like this looks so freaking amazing and then i kind of think well where would i wear it yeah. um because it looks like it, it it looks like I should be driving a, ty- a Tesla Cybertruck on the planet on, on Saturn, which is a gaseous giant, so probably just <laughs> no place to drive. But on Saturn, and then I should step out with head to toe with you know a cold wall with glasses and the you know shirt bottoms yeah. and the shoes, and it's it's absolutely amazing stuff. Um, but then I don't know where I could wear it. Now, on the other hand, I do have pair of cold wallet sneaks that my wife got for me recently. Um, appreciate it. Um, and they're fantastic. It's a Converse, um, it's a cold wall Converse collab. And they're freaking amazing. They look awesome. And so, you know, again, I, I love the fact that these designers are able to, you know, and they're innovative leaders, right? They're able to push the envelope and they can start to blend kind of like what's the real world and then what about our digital space? And, and again, I think a cold wall is one of those really, really unique brands that does that. And he pulls in really futuristic looks um, and there's like modern hard edges. And in, in my opinion, right, I think they look fantastic. Yeah. So, And I'm wondering about brands that are, you know, they may want to be able to tell their story, but they don't know how to do it. Like they know how to make an amazing product. They know who they are. They know why they're there, but their execution or their idea might not be on point. So then how do you help them with that? 
there, there's a, you know, I would say there's somewhat of a formula to it, but again, you have to answer, you know, the core, the five Y, the five W's first, right? So you have to go to that and really understand who you are, what your brand's all about, you know, who's your audience, what problem are you trying to solve yeah. very, very, you know, concretely and very, very focused into this is the message. Here's who it is about. Here's why we do it. Um, and then you go from there, right? So part of it is packing the the eye candy so to speak and the music and the you know captivating words and, and imagery and putting all of those nuggets inside of there so people are learning about the brand they're learning about the product they don't feel like they're being talked to or or talked at they're being yeah. spoken to right and of course you know if you can throw some humor in there or if you could make it very seductive again depending on your brand persona or your business persona um you you absolutely use those things in your brand voice um to tell the journey or to to illustrate the journey and help people feel um that they are a part of it and you're you're doing it together you know we want to educate people and then we want to entertain them we want to tell we want to have theatrical brand storytelling it needs to be interactive right interactive storytelling you have to hold everyone's attention because there's there are a million things vying for our attention yeah and with brand storytelling i've also noticed there are a lot of brands where if they are not authentic they are yesterday's news real fast it's it, it's it's fascinating actually how um how dangerous it has become to try to be something that you're not in, in the mm. social media kind of generation. Yeah. I don't know how, I don't know if the generation that is maybe older or is older, younger than, than, than the Gen Xers where I am, if they are clairvoyant, I don't know what it is, but they, they can pick up on it. Um, I have an eight year old and I can tell you they, she is more in tune with what she wants her feelings about it uh, when she's unhappy than, than I ever was at eight. I just wanted to go outside and drink from the water hose when it was hot in Florida. And <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting because with the rise of Web3, it's becoming even more evident um, that you have to make sure that your brand storytelling is future proof. You know, here at TechSmart, we, we really work on e-commerce. We yeah. help build great experiences that are captivating. We execute and help you execute on strategies that drive down customer acquisition costs um, that, you know, again, help accelerate profit and revenue for you. So how do you take that next step? How do you, how do you move on to what's next? And, and as you said, right, with Web3 coming into the forefront, and it's still very, you know, in the infancy stage, but those things coming in, you know, what do you do? How do you start to future proof and tell your story in, in just a, just a slightly different way um, and bring people in? And I think it's number one, it's, it has to be interactive. You right. have to get people engaged and how do you make people engaged? Um, you create mini quests. Um, you have, maybe you hide a little Easter egg someplace that, Oh, wait a minute. What was that? Right. Oh shoot! And then and then it blows their mind because they're like, oh, this 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 brand is actually fun. This is cool. Is what yeah. else is there hiding around? <laughs> yeah. Let and me dig around too. just a little bit more. <laughs> exactly, and and capture their dollars. Um, but but <laughs> you have to create those experiences um, for people, and it does two things. One, it, it pulls them in, it makes them, um, it gets them interested. But two, they talk. People mm. talk to other people. They talk to their friends. They talk to their loved ones. They tell their mom, their dad, and then then so what happened? Then they're gonna go check it out. So now you're starting to get this multiplier, this network multiplier effect of um, of your experience and, and bringing those things to you know to bear. I think number two is really starting to blend um, physical and digital. So we talked earlier about digital fashion. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's, you know, maybe some of the digital fashion items that have been created thus far don't exist in the real world. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, but if you're trying to bridge the gap from kind of, you know, this current set of, of purchasers to the, the younger folks, you actually need to bridge that gap. So what if you sold your same physical goods and you used power of the blockchain to mm -hmm. register this NFT that is a digital representation of the physical good you just sold. And now 
you have lots of different vendors or different um, experience experiences that can then pull that NFT in and either dress it as an avatar. If it's a hat, maybe they put it on their avatar. If it's a purse, maybe you wear the avatar, you know, crossbody, something like that. So it goes across the avatar. Um, I think we're going to start, we're going to see more and more of that starting to happen um, in these immersive experiences. And that is the way to, again, you're, you're, still selling the physical good to, mm -hmm. to maybe the people like us who, who are a little bit older and buy them and we're maybe not in all the, the new age, um, you know, 3D experiences. But if my kid is in that 3D experience and I have the NFT, I'm going to be like, yeah, sure, here you go. Go wear it, you know, load it and wear it. And all their friends are like, oh my gosh, what's that? And of course the NFT will have more attributes and data about it and it'll look cool or maybe there's some cutscenes, whatever. Um, and I think the third thing is, is really AR. Um, I think before we get into to VR, we're really gonna see a boom in AR. And I think, I think people are starting to see that now. Everyone has AR on their site. We're starting to see um, AR driven ads. Um, I saw one the other day that was, was fascinating on LinkedIn. Someone held their phone out horizontally, you know, kind of flat and it, it was AR, but it looked like the shoe the came shoe, out I saw of, yeah, it came out of the phone and they could, you know, it kind of spun around and whatnot. And, and so that's what I mean by interactive. We're going to see more and more of that to really stop people from just kind of up swipe next. We're going to see more of those interactive experiences that stop people in their tracks and mm -hmm. force them to like, look at this product, understand it. And you can then, again, while you're doing that, you can teach them about the product. You can teach them about the brand and they're going to be, you know, much more dialed in to see, well, what's next. And if next is purchase, you, you got them on the hook right there. Right. And if you make it really easy without like putting it in a card and check, if you, if it's right there and you just hit the button and it just, it's an Apple pay. Yeah. Boom. Again, I think one thing that, that we learned from Virgil, Virgil Abloh, uh, you know, unfortunately recently passed is you can't go from zero to 100 on the innovation scale. Humankind, we're not ready for that. Our minds don't process. We don't get it. We don't understand it. There's resistance to that. But if you can take a 3% innovative step, that's about as much as people can take at a time, and they, but they will take that step, and they will go with you. And you can take the three, and you can lock in. You take another three, and you can lock in, and you can bring people down the road of where you're trying to go, um, but you have to take those bite-sized chunks. We look at these brands um, that are so already so far advanced in the physical space in their physical stores like Kith, it is an experience um, with BMW when he worked the BMW campaign or, you know, the hall of sneakers when you're walking in and the casts are there. Mm -hmm. What do you think that they can actually like ha elevating their story and bringing their story and their, their brand message into the next realm? Um, almost blows my mind because the possibilities are already endless for them and they've already captured that and they're they're riding it. One of the things that, that Ronnie Fig did there is is humanize the brand by sharing his memories. So he kind of was able to look back and, and he loved these cars. So he was able to reach back on his memories and then share that with people who follow the brand. And then, you know, so they it's relatable, right? Um, I, I think one of the things when we look at some of these installations, they are, they really are works of art. We have to think back now, Kith may be a little bit different, but he hired someone who was an artist to, to develop the theme for each store and each store is different. Yeah. Um, the store in New York is very different from the store in LA, which is different from the one in Paris. I've been to New York. I've been to Paris. Um, I have not been to LA, but I'd love to go see that one too. Cause he integrated the kind of Ivy around the shoe cast. And, and I, you know, I'd Thank like you. to go see that, um, you know, but, but you're right. You walk into each one of those stores and, and there's a, there's a feel to it. Um, it's an experience. The music, again, the first time I went to the one in Paris, I walk in and it was like I was at a nightclub and it's wow. two o'clock in the afternoon and they're playing Biggie. And I'm in yeah. Paris and it's Biggie and then they're playing, then it's Nas and, and then there's, uh, you know, then we're hearing the song, I can't remember the old, Most Deaf. Oh, it it wow. was, I was like, 
am I in New York or am I in Paris? <laughs> but it didn't matter because I was, it was great. I was in it. I loved it. Everyone was happy. People were walking around. Everyone was just smiling and, you know, looking at shoes and looking at shirts and jackets. And it was absolutely amazing. And, and again, on the flip side, if you go look at, if you go to Dover Street Market and you look at, um, you know, Comme des Garçons, some of the brands that are there, every corner that's specific to or that's built around a particular designer, it all has to be approved by the lead designer of Comme des Garçons. Wow. Ray has to approve every single inch of anything that's installed in that store because she has a look and a feel. These designers who create um, who create these products, who create fashion, they are artists, right? Ray mm -hmm. doesn't live in the U.S. <laughs> She's in Japan. Right? She lives in Japan, but she has a store in New York. There's a big giant, uh, you know, Dover Street Market in L.A. I believe there's one in London. Obviously, there's one in Japan. Um, they're all different, and they all have different designers and different clothing, clothing items, but the installations there are all different. They're all designed by her. They have to have her approval. And so, again, it is, it's, it's, it's like going to a museum. Yeah. What was um, some of your, I don't know if you have like a, a favorite immersive experience or a certain um, brand tale that you've seen executed? Um, good question. <laughs> um, most of the ones that they don't have necessarily an immersive experience that I can think of. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, but I can speak a bit about some of the brands that I love the physical location. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I, and that's why I'm doing this. That's, that's why I'm in the place that I am. This is why we have this business because I want to help. I want to, um, help some of those brands branch out and take the, the gorgeous, beautiful things that they are creating physically mm -hmm. and apply those to a digital space so they can reach a lot of larger audience and maybe a global audience um, that maybe can't get to that particular, you know, the three locations that they have. Look at um, Maison Margiela. The, the, the main store on Avenue Montagna in Paris. If you walk in and they hired an architect to come up with these, um, this concept of how they did the store, but it was, it was a concept that was built upon like concrete columns and concrete flooring um, and, and hard marble, but it was meant to look kind of puffy and soft like a pillow. And it's, it's, it, <laughs> So that's that's exactly when I walked in, I was like, my everything was kind of tilted because you could tell it was it was it looked very soft, but if you touch it, it's like oh, it's like concrete, and it felt like concrete, and it looked but it it looked like you know you know kids have stuffies, we call them stuffies, yeah. and they're kind of just you know oversized and 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 it's it was the most fascinating thing ever but you look in uh, you walk into that store and and that's what you see and then there's marble um you know um you know kind of pull outs and things like that and it's very slick and very modern but it also lends back to the old classic look and it's kind of you know kind of a cream color and then mm -hmm. you go into the dressing room and you open this, this this pivot door with a long stainless steel handle and you open the door and it's all black. It's but it's shiny black. Like think of like a hammered uh, ring, like a hammered texture, black walls. But it's super shiny, and they have bright white lights around the mirror so that you you see the white on the black. And you go in there, and you're you're just in this totally different space. But and that's what I mean by so it was very immersive because as you're there, you're like forget about looking at the shoes and everything else. <laughs> you're like looking around and and checking out everything else, and you're like well, let me play play in the dressing room for a minute, right. like. You know, and I, I spent a lot of time there um, just kind of checking out the store. Um, and I and I thought it was done fantastically. Um, you know, Maison Alaï is a different one, and it had a totally different look and feel. And the heart shape is kind of the core um, shape or the, the, you know, it's kind of part of their logo. Um, but you go in there, and it's very elegant. Mm -hmm. And there's big soaring ceilings. And you walk in and all the shelving that's on the walls, it's all floating shelves. So you don't see any like, you know, there's no stands or arms or legs holding up. It's just kind of 
was just thing coming mm-hmm. out of the wall. Um, but it, but it's absolutely fantastic. And you walk in, and they have the way they have the the mannequins, the faceless mannequins, positioned that you kind of have to like worm your way through and around that are showing things. And you're like, am I am I in the catwalk? Am I walking through this fashion show? Um, you know, and there's a lot of glass, and they have these very futuristic um, light elements. And you look like, oh my gosh, just a totally custom light. How much did it cost them to build that giant, oversized? It looks like a giant donut almost. It, it just oh you know, it takes up like the size of the room on <laughs> some of these rooms. Um, but you know, it was like just, you know, someone had to come up with this concept and build it. So again, right, if it, 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 you are immersed, it was very much immersive um, in these, but these are physical places. Um, you know, again, it doesn't have to be virtual to be immersive. When, when you think about these stores, like they, you know, who came up with it, right? You have, there's a strategy behind all of this. And again, you want, when, you, when somebody walks through those doors, you have to trans, transport them into a new space, you know, you have to either speak to the heart space, open the heart space, um, and then what do you want them to feel? What emotions do you want to evoke? How are you going to help them, you know, how are you going to convince them that this is the place that they need to be, right? Yeah. So we think about some of these items, you know, a thousand dollars for a purse, or if you buy a Remoa bag, it might be a three thousand dollar suitcase, $3,000 for suitcase, that's a lot of money. Well, LVMH and Louis Vuitton, they're famous for passing their steam trunks or their steamer trunks down to family members. That's right. Um, and, it, you know, family members will actually inherit those pieces. And it, I love the fact that it tells the tale of the family. And that, again, that's the beautiful thing, right? When you when you actually get into some of the, the history of the Maison and, and why do they use certain materials and then why do they do it that way? It's, there's a craftsmanship that comes into play um, that's yeah. required for things to, to hold up over time. Um, and so it's, it's, it's one of those things that, it, to me, that's where it would be fascinating to see, well, who was the first, you know, who was the, the original Maison that built the steamer trunk? And why did he do it the way that he did it? And if you're able to tell that story, tell the story of craftsmanship, why you do it, um, how you do it, I think it's, I think it's just, you know, it's just marvelous and it's one of those things you just you absolutely put into the storytelling of the brand. It's the DNA. Thank you for watching Virtually Confidential Brand Storytelling and the Human Connection. Don't forget to like and subscribe on YouTube.